Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm really excited today because you may remember, if you've been with us that long, that in episode six, Josh Levine came on and we talked about Blitz Spirit and kind of tried to dispel the myth that everybody was lovely and cuddly and singing We'll Meet Again uh, in 1940. And somebody sat there and thought, I'm not bloody having this. Uh, Not listening to that episode, but at the time when people were invoking us, I thought, no, I need to do a book. Um, And she is Becky Brown. She's an anthologist and editor and a literary agent. Uh, And she's got a fascination with forgotten voices and hidden stories. And you were just angry, weren't you, Becky? And you were like, no, I need to tell people actually how this happened. Yeah, I was so cross. I was so cross at how everybody was just simplifying it and and also assuming that as a nation, we might have all had one opinion. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, if you, if you look at us now, the fact that you can believe that, you know, to look at any point in the past and think that everybody thought and did the same thing is just baffling to me. It's brilliant. And so you have used to compile this because it is a book of forgotten voices and you use the mass observation archive. So before we have a look at some of these and have a chuckle at how many parallels there are with <laughs> our sad lives now, um, what is the mass observation archive? Well, the ma- sorry, the Mass Observation Archive, it, it is this extraordinary collection that, that really does show just how crazily good scholarly foresight can be. So it was founded in 1937, and the idea, the guy who founded it, or one of the trio of men who founded it, was a bird watcher, and he wanted to study the people of Britain as if they were birds, to like ask people to watch each other and to watch their own lives and record, you know, those tiny little bits of domestic life that you know, that you don't notice that you do because you're just living them. Mm. And they asked as many people as wanted to, you know, to to join in, to send in diaries of their lives. Uh, and the idea was that they were anonymous, they would be stored forever, and they would be this great, you know, pool of reference for historians in the future. And over 500 people regularly submitted diaries throughout World War II, all, all of which just talked about what it was like to be a normal person living through a really, you know, abnormal time. This is brilliant. So what I've done is I've gone through and I've picked out some extracts that sort of sum up some of the feelings that were about (laughs) when we can chuckle about how many parallels they have now. So for 1939, I went for you had an evacuee from London who went down to Cornwall. And so 1939 is a bit of an anticlimax, isn't it? And this person says, uh, it's just F, writer and artist, the Red Cross activities continue, though now they have reached the stage where feuds are likely to develop and some petty jealousy has already been exhibited because one person was allowed to do all the cutting out. And so it goes on, dead and dull day after day, and from what I hear, the BEF feel nothing better on the Western Front. One mother reporting that her son was simply bored to death with being in France with nothing to do. A war of ennui, as Hamburg so aptly put it. <laughs> so the idea that everybody um flung themselves into action is rubbish. oh yeah oh it's complete fallacy i mean i think one of the things we do looking backwards is we have this tendency to kind of compress the war into one event but actually where you know when you go through the years and it's almost six years of conflict every year is so distinctly different and in 1939 although war had been declared it, it, it was what we now call the phony war and nothing was happening apart from at sea. You know, people were kind of sinking the odd merchant ship, but otherwise it, it was quiet and people were, you know, people were being restricted in all these different ways, but they weren't really seeing why, because, you know, nothing, no one was attacking them. Nothing was happening. <laughs> Do you know what, though? This next one, 1940, this is my mum. And, like, literally, <laughs> I have got a read. I've got, like, as soon as she gives me a shit fat now, I say... Did you get that from Piers Morgan? Because if so, I don't want to hear it. If you got it from watching Good Morning Britain, it's not a proper fact and I'm not interested. Or if you got it on Facebook. So one of the things that you have from 1940 says, he told me that the experts said that the German measles had been sent over by the Germans. When I asked him what experts, he just said, the experts. And I was not able to convince him otherwise. This is so happening now, isn't it? I think people, you know, people think that fake news is this kind of modern social media phenomenon, but it's fascinating how much it arises through the diaries. Like, There's one um, diarist who I really love, who's a kind of a trainee engineer, and he lives in Wiltshire, near, near where my parents live now. And in like 1943, he's convinced that there's been a bovine TV outbreak because the Germans are dropping infected Stalin, not <laughs> Stalin's, not Stalin's, Starlings, the bird, not the dictator, <laughs> um, from, <laughs> from aeroplanes. You know, which is completely false. And all through the war, you know, people 
are fed on rumour and speculation and, you know, the kind of things they believe are ludicrous to us now. It's brilliant, though, isn't it? Because in 100 years time, people are going to look back at COVID and go, I can't believe they were buying this. Yeah, I know. I know. And also, I mean, in, you know, in the Second World War, information was shrouded in as much secrecy as the government could muster because they were convinced that, you know, if Germany knew something, you know, if, if they knew what the weather was that day, they'd be able to work something out. If they knew which city had been hit by a bomb last night, they'd be able to adjust their coordinates and, you know, and hit a bigger city or a better area the next night. So there was this real suppression of information and what grew up in, you know, in that gap was just rumour you know oh I heard from someone who heard from someone else who heard from someone else that you know everyone in Coventry died last night <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like Piers Morgan World War II style yeah it, re- it really is yeah Oh my God. Uh, so ni- 1941, I love, right? I found two total polar opposites, but we have them both now with COVID. So uh, this is an army officer from South Ascot in Berkshire in 1941 at the end of the year, who's uh, discussing, um, you know, the people that were militant about playing by the rules and being good. And he says, it started with my mother saying what a waste she considered big dinner parties were with five or six courses and was very glad that the war had put a stop to them. My grandmother and aunt were most annoyed about this and said they always liked to give their guests a really good dinner. Their maids liked it, etc. I kept quiet at first to see what line my mother would take and almost felt that at any moment she would come out with the communist manifesto. (laughs) Yeah, you know, one of the things, and it's funny when I started when I started compiling the book, it, it was really in response to kind of the agonising about stockpiling. You know, oh, everyone's going out and buying toilet paper. Like, where's their national spirit? Why can't they just buy as much toilet paper as they need? But as I, you know, in the months that I was writing it our sort of national habits evolved you know as people responded to different parts of the pandemic the stockpiling you know sort of turned into worrying about masks and then it turned into worrying about social distancing and and all these things just kept rising up in the diaries to you know to meet those new things and one of the ones within that that fascinated me the most is this idea of how people cluster around identifying themselves with a certain way of responding to something so you know you have the people who it becomes a part of their identity that they follow the rules and you have the people where it's a part of their identity that they're skeptical about the rules and you know and I think now that that's shown as people who arrive like oh I never go to a restaurant now I'm just not going until the pandemic's over and people being like no you know I'm supporting the economy I'm going to eat out once a week and you do get that you know you do get that with the World War II diarists as well the people who feel like they're beholden to upholding the old order and making sure it survives and the people who you know are just all in for the war effort and that becomes a massive part of who they are and what they do you do but then a month later you had a housewife from bedford that you quoted and this is brilliant because for me she seems to be like the blitz equivalent of those crazies walking around walmart charlie no masks no masks in america (laughs) she says uh, i met a woman today who declares that she takes no notice of any appeals but burns all paper destroys salvage in her view the government have no right to interfere with the even tenure of her life (laughs) (laughs) when I found that I was like right well that's going in yeah (laughs) and I think that there was definitely as well within the people who did follow the rules I think there's a marked tendency to exaggerate that quality in other people and to kind of you know fall into those camps but there were certainly people like that you know who not only bent the rules for their own you know for, for their own means but also actively subverted the rules as a point of principle and you know we see that now as well very much so (laughs) <laughs> 1942 what did I dig out for 1942 ah okay so this is something that I think people will really resonate with people from this year so this is an office worker um, who also worked in a volunteer mobile canteen in London in November 42 says felt really dead today and spent it in bed with a hot water bottle class to my middle odd how when one feels bad the news seems unimportant nothing short of the armistice could have moved me today Mm-hmm. I, as you know, she's one of my very favourites mm. because she's so explicit about her emotions, and a lot of them there is this kind of slightly coy, you know, they they don't want to be too negative, you know, they don't. And I think there was back then a real sort of people did feel a duty to not, you know, undermine morale, which I think is one of the things that has really you know, pushed us into this idea that blitz spirit was real, which is that people were kind of presenting a front of positivity and and those moments are so interesting when you do just see 
you know, the human frailty behind trying to survive through what is, you know, a huge and life changing crisis for all of them. And as well, it's like something, how are they talking about mental health as well? Because obviously it's become okay this year, a lot more okay to just say, I feel really bad and I can't handle this today. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, that didn't, that didn't happen at all. You know, apart from, you know, people's personal support networks, they might be able to turn to their spouse or to the, you know, their sister or their best friend. But otherwise, it it really was just suppressed. And and it is striking in the diaries how many people are just miserable, you know. And and I think we forget now, again, looking back, we forget about the lives they had before the war. You know, these were people, you know, who had plans and those plans evaporated for six years. And there's this wonderful diary right right at the beginning of someone who says I can't believe there's a war just now just when my life is starting you know she's kind of 19 and yeah. she's just so she's so cross well, and, it's the same with the kids that miss their exams and all their school leave stuff and their proms this year isn't there yeah and I exactly. think we've had one year they had six yeah I mean and, and that is you know the the further we've got into this thing the more amazed I've been by I think in some ways resilience is the wrong word because, you know, that makes it sound like it was deliberate. And I think it's just how you have to live, Mm. you know, like, you know, you can't stop there being a war in the same way you can't stop there being a pandemic. You have to weather it somehow. But to imagine doing six times more time than we've done with this. Yeah. So like we uh, will be one year older. Your holiday would have been packed by a year. Uh, Mm -hmm. You may have deferred your uni place for a year. But these are people that could have been 16 year old schoolgirls at the beginning and sort of would have expected to be married even by the end of this. So that is a huge chunk of their lives, isn't it? Yeah, it's massive. And you see a lot, particularly towards the end of the war, a lot of kind of people really speculating about what's it like for these children who, you know, who were born in, say, like 1937 or, you know, even as late as 1939, whose entire lives have been dictated by the war you know there, there's a woman in 1944 who says when the you know when the little children after the war are given presents by santa claus at the department store they're going to just drop dead from shock <laughs> you know because yeah. all these all these little you know frivolous things just haven't existed for them and there's another woman who notes in in 1945 these two sort of young children standing at the fruit and vegetable shop and they're looking at some tomatoes that are accidentally in the fruit section and they're asking what are these fruits you know how can we eat them because they don't get these you know there have been no bananas no oranges no you know there's been nothing but apples for three years and and they don't know what the tomatoes are they think they're some sort of magical fruit that's insane i love as well we we just mentioned the the supermarkets and people queuing Uh, back at the beginning of this and you have one from 1943 and it says a letter in the chronicle this morning which just says what i've been saying recently about food food cues it is becoming a fetish and you can tell by the complacent look on people's faces that they think they're just doing the right thing by lining up (laughs) yeah i really i really (laughs) saw that didn't we yeah it's it's like it's exactly the same thing it's herd mentality and it hasn't changed at all you know And, and i think we want to believe that people back then you know were all just keeping calm and carrying on but actually you know they were perfectly willing to stand outside the fishmongers for three hours to get a piece of fish even if they didn't want fish that night just because you know they walked past the queue and there it was yeah I love, I love that we always think we're smarter don't we than yeah. the people that came before us and it just this year if nothing else you can laugh at the fact that um we are just as dumb as our forebears. <laughs> well, do you know, I saw on Twitter literally yesterday, someone had posted a thing being like, imagine if everybody in the Blitz had just been like, no, I will keep my light on. I don't care. And, you know, all these people in the comments being like, oh, we, you know, we've declined as a nation. Like, it's dreadful. And, and actually, you know, throughout the diaries, there are people who leave their lights on all the time and they're only kept, you know, they're only kept in place by massive fines <laughs> and the threat of imprisonment, you know, because people didn't believe that it helped. You know, they felt that there was enough light and enough, you know, and, and good enough like navigational technology that the Germans would drop their bombs anyway. And they were sat there you know looking at huge road casualty figures of people hit by cars in the dark people having terrible accidents kind of falling down holes or off pavements and and they were saying what's the point we might as well have the lights on you know so it's not a but the fact that 
that that gets rolled out and people say oh look we all used to comply for the greater good and we didn't yeah and that was my next one is there's an accountant um and volunteer police constable from sheffield in that you've got for 1943 and i i love that one of the things now is why don't the police do anything they don't stop anyone from breaking the rules and this guy is just showing you because they're as pissed off as we are he says Mm -hmm. uh 15th of september 1943 two blackout offenses and a cyclist riding without lights formed the sum total of the incidents on my police beat this evening i had to get a man out of his bath to attend to one of the blackouts there seems to be a general carelessness and blackouts and i really should have complained at several more places Yeah, there's so, I mean, the the blackout out of everything is the thing that is complained about the most. But by, by, like, it's a million miles ahead of even food, which was a massive preoccupation for most people. But it was just, they all found it so depressing. And, you know, once you got into the winter, you just, you, you lived in dark for most of the day. And I mean, I do really feel for them. And I'm actually, I mean, you know, I'm not, I, I am an anthologist. I'm not a historian. It's an important point to make. But reading through it, I'm quite convinced by it as an argument that the blackout did more harm than good. Yeah. And they uh, also as well, there's not as much hatred for the enemy. as like, There were quite a few instances of people feeling bad about bombing raids and things like that. And the one that I really liked as well, you had a retired teacher um, who's from Great Missenden in Buckinghamshire. And she's clearly got a friend somewhere uh, who's german but somewhere in the uk and it says had a letter from my german friend saying that she has a little daughter and speaking most highly of the treatment she is receiving in hospital it made me quite proud of my country to think that an enemy alien and her illegitimate baby should be so well treated i can't bear the bulldog breed and i am not drawn to lions but i do appreciate tolerance and kindness which is very interesting because she's sort of against the railing uh, rule obeying hardliners and Mm -hmm. she's not not into heroes either but she just thinks that this is nice yeah I mean what's so interesting and I think that we forget as well because we tend when we think about history to compartmentalize World War One from World War Two but so many of the people you know like anyone in there who's listed as a retired anything also lived through the first World War you know they've lived through the decimation of their population like the loss of you know hundreds of thousands of young men and, and, you know, by that point, by the point, you know, she's written that, which is late in the war, also hundreds of thousands of civilian casualties. And they're, they're fed up. They're fed up of bloodshed. They want it fixed, you know. And, and it is interesting. There's a lot of obviously a massive kind of release valve on VE Day where people are like, thank God it's over. But they're not really jubilant at having won. They're just glad it's the end. Yeah, there's another one shortly after that from 44 as well. It's it's, it's a longer one, but it's another woman. It's a journalist. And she says uh, that she was having a conversation with someone about the Germans getting it far worse. And that as she says, and that flesh and blood ought not to be asked to endure such things. Such seems to be the general verdict. And a woman at the office just now discussed with me the fact that Europe is just being smashed to nothing. And we agreed that the coming business would carry on the good work and what would be left of civilization day by day, everything gets more tough and brutal was very upset by the terrific loss of bomb uh, bombers over Leipzig and thought of the air crew boy. I talked to the other night. He was probably in it. He was nothing them but a walking mass of nerves a shadow man uh, that one that one still upsets me a little bit it's yeah. so evocative I mean she she's a wonderful diarist as well she's so attuned to kind of how other people are feeling yeah but it's yeah I mean I, I think you know it's quite easy to make flippant comparisons between now and the war it, it's one of the things that made me cross enough to write the book mm. and, and you know it what's important to remember is that for most of us we've never seen loss of life like World War Two. Yeah, you know the scale of it is extraordinary, and you know while we kind of sit here and you know it's like oh four hundred more people dead today, five hundred more dead today, you know they were picking up the newspaper each morning to things like six thousand lives lost at sea, like you know, mm. and a hundred thousand houses destroyed across the southeast of England or, or whatever, and. Yeah, yeah, there was a yeah. research chemist as well from Broxbourne, wasn't there? And like, this is, we were talking before we came on air and we said that we, we have, no one's trying to kill us right now. Mm-hmm. So 
it is fun to make the comparisons, but he writes in 1945 at the beginning, one of the V2s was within, within a mile of the works and there were at least six more today, making me rather uneasy. Being under fire may be a stimulant to a soldier, but even in this diffuse way, it is a bad influence rather than an ennobling one on an ordinary civilian. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's very interesting, actually, because the V1s and the V2s had a far greater emotional impact on people than the Blitz did. And I think in some ways there is a compa- there's a comparison to be made with that first lockdown, that kind of sense of, of the whole country coming together to sort of be like, right, we're all going to stay home. And, you know, during the first blitzes, there was a sense of just, you know, blanket death everywhere. Just, you know, these nights where however many hundreds of bombs fell from the sky and whole cities were on fire. But with the V1s and V2s, they, you know, they came over silently. They just fell out of the air and, you know, and blasted a massive crater wherever they landed. And it was arbitrary. And it wasn't collective either. You know, you weren't going through it with other people. If you were unlucky enough to be standing where it fell, you were dead. And it's fascinating how different that made people feel to going through that experience together. It really is. And one thing you've already, we've already kind of slightly touched on the fact that this assumption that everybody thought the same and everyone had the same opinions about things and how nonsense it is because people can be dicks wherever you are. You get enough people together and some of them will be dicks. I mean, this is a clerk and a housewife from Sheffield in February 44 who says, my hairdresser today told me of a case she knows personally. Two women they know went to a wedding where they were lovely eats, got in the black market. The next day they went to the food office and reported it. (laughs) <laughs> what <laughs> there's so there's so much of that there's so much snitching on neighbors yeah. i say it's one of the most you know one of the most kind of frequent things that appears and people you know and also just the amount that people judged one another it mm. you know it's not that there's not really a sense of togetherness there and, and i think what you know one of the things that has made me frustrated with how we've engaged with the idea of, of what we did in world war ii was it so so much of what worked was was you know it, it was in a legal framework it was mandated by the government it was strictly policed and people for the most part obeyed it mm. and you know I, I don't think it would have happened any differently now if there had been a firm enough <laughs> rule you know yeah. and it's, it's not that they're good it's just that they're compliant and th- those are very different things being a good person and an obedient person are, are different and you can see that in the diarists yeah, the judgmental thing. Just, do you remember when the supermarkets were only, you were only supposed to leave the house for essentials and people behind you in the queue would be looking in your basket to see what you were buying? Mm-hmm. And like, there was a poor woman who obviously went to Audi and she had her food shopping, but she thought, that's a cheap dustbin. I'll pick that up while I'm here. And she's all over Twitter and people are going, what's she doing out of her house with that dustbin? That's not an essential. And I'm just like, guys, really? Also, you just don't know, do you? Like, you don't know why someone's there. Like, I remember walking past a, a very like frail-looking old lady in, in my local supermarket who had literally just bought some hot cross buns and an orange. Like, definitely not essential. But yeah. also, you know, like for all I knew, she had no one at home, and that was the only thing she was doing that day. And you know, she already had the rest of her food, but she wanted to go outside. And it's like it's a human yeah. urge to go outside. <laughs> my best one was going into Morrison's and being in the queue with a basket with twelve bottles of their cheapest brand white wine in my basket and this guy looking at me and then the woman in front of him looking at me and they looked at each other and went not essential and I went you can shut up right now both of you you don't know me I don't know you these are for a 90 year old woman who's shielding I asked her did she need anything and by god she wants to get pissed and this is all she wanted and I would damn well take it to her and they just yeah. went, oh, we're really sorry, I didn't know. And said, no, you didn't. So shut up, turn around and yeah. focus well, on your own shopping. Also, it's that urge, isn't it? That human urge to tell someone else what to do. And that's what I don't yes. understand. Like, judge away quietly in your head. But there are so many instances in the diaries of people kind of trying to police other people. I mean, sometimes very legitimately. But still, it, you know, there's a difference there, I think. Glass houses and stones as well, unless you are totally perfect. I don't, you know, I the book is I don't know however many pages long 300 and I you know I read probably 80,000 pages of diaries in in compiling it and I don't think there is a single diarist who could be said to have complied with everything you know like they all gently bend the rules and in ways that they need to you know for the most part and it's 
yeah, I know. I, ju- I just got so cross at the idea that everyone just did what they were told for six years. Yeah. <laughs> if that would happen. What was really interesting for me was getting to the end of the war in the book and getting to 1945, because we're not at the end of Corona yet. And one thing I was talking to uh, one of the other trustees of the charity I run, and we were talking about the fact that we're we think people will spend quite a lot of money when this is over and it might be like boom times. And that Mm -hmm. seems to have been the case to an extent in 45, because you have someone saying, I consider it a fallacy that a country can spend its way back to prosperity. Certainly spending money does help to cause employment, but is the community any better off? I very much doubt it. So do we think people will go out and just go nuts? It's very interesting, isn't it? I mean, I think one comparable thing in the diaries is that you do have this kind of group of people who have been enriched by the war in some ways that people who had you know very poorly paid jobs before and then found well-paid war work and you know in the factories or or you know in the army or, or the navy or wherever and they don't really have anything to spend that money on because you know because of rationing and good shortages and and there are a few things that people do go nuts for like there's this wonderful moment where everyone wants to buy a piano and no one can get one <laughs> which, <laughs> which, you know, and it's because they they have the money for these kind of large purchases and they, you, know, you can tell what they're thinking they're thinking this will bring me so much pleasure in the evenings I'm having to spend a lot of time inside you know I kind of view it as similar to when everyone was buying yeast <laughs> you yeah. know, it's like, I've got time to bake bread now and you know, they were like I've got time to learn the piano and those and, peloton bikes as well yes that yeah exactly that's off. probably closer yeah really closer comparison <laughs> but you know so you do have these people with vast amounts of money to spend and you know towards the end of the war you do have a government that is trying to get people to spend them um, absolutely because they want to drive the economy up don't they well totally and you know and i think a lot of the more cynical diarists you know see the whole war as a kind of money making exercise anyway and you know some rich people did get very much richer during the war you know industrialists and you know there were lots of people who profited from it yeah, and, and well, there's that, supermarkets now, isn't there? So, yeah, exactly. And I it think is they similar. should be putting money into pubs. I think some of their profits should be helping pubs get over the line because so many of the pub owners, because I, I used to work in the industry, are not going to survive a third lockdown. They'll be mm-hmm. done. Yeah, well, I, you know, I feel very much the same about um, about Amazon and independent bookshops. Mm, you know, like, as someone who works in the publishing industry, that so much business has gone to Amazon, you know, purely because of how good their delivery system is and you know, it, it's it's been very much at the expense of brick and mortar booksellers and you, you know you'd love to see a bit of like a little bit of rebalancing there but you know it didn't happen in world war ii and it probably won't happen now yeah this is true i mean there's a stenographer from birmingham who says as the war's coming to a close i still can't grasp or believe that the actual war itself is nearly over i suppose few people with the ordinary size of imagination or soul can rise to an occasion of this size so as to experience it fully yeah it's it's funny i was very interested last week to see well, it wasn't it was probably this week time has just compressed and yeah. expanded this in the strangest way. <laughs> everything's just one long yeah. day of nothing i know well do you know it might have been this week but anyway everyone calling the you know the first vaccines v-day and, and wanting that that comparison and, and actually it, it's quite apt because you know the war didn't end on ve day yeah. you know it kept going till vj day but even after that you know people couldn't come home from those countries there was restructuring to do you know everything was a mess and rationing continues well into the 1950s and a lot of the hardships that people went through in the war continued long after it but mm-hmm. without that kind of excuse you know without that thing to make you feel better about why you're suffering you know that yeah. you're working towards a greater cause and uh, you know it, there are lots of people lots of diarists who right after vj right how deflated they feel that they've had this one day of kind of, you know, boozing and, and celebration. But, you know, the day afterwards, there's still no onions. Like their family members are still overseas fighting. Or, well, not fighting, but, you know, clearing up. Yeah. And, yeah, you know, it, it's not that neat end. And there's a vicar from Boston in Lincolnshire as well, who says, I'm, and this is July, he says, I mentioned to a doctor today what a lot of illness there seems to be about. And he says that since VE Day, there has been a very great amount of work for doctors. He puts it down to the sudden relaxation of tension. It's mostly tummy troubles. Yeah, I, I'm so unsurprised by that. Like every, every, every time I don't have a holiday for a while, and I have a, quite a stressful job, as soon as I stop for a holiday, I get sick. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's a universal <laughs> human thing. And I, 
occasionally I did just include things because they resonated with me personally so much and that's definitely one of them (laughs) yeah I mean so and another thing as well is so I managed to get away a couple of times this year and I've already noticed across Europe um that there are masks everywhere it's become the new major litter item and there was one uh she's a clerk and a housewife again from sheffield who says uh, a thing and a thing two ugly things who will tell us where to dump civilian gas masks on fire guard tin hats they just take up room now i'll be glad of the space in his flat i love that i mean i love the sort of the moments like that that just feel so universally human yeah, because you, know, you can imagine it, can't you? All, 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 like all the perspex screens in in shops and restaurants and stuff. Are like, wh- where are they going to go? Yeah, <laughs> or just know? being able to like when you walk into a pub, hug your friend without thinking everyone's looking at you and judging you. Mm-hmm. It's going to be amazing. I mean, do you know, uh, masks are one of the most interesting things because when I started when I started compiling the book, it, it wasn't you know we'd actually been like Boris Johnson had been like, oh, don't wear masks; they're not helpful. And so I wasn't really thinking about them that much. And then as the months went by and they became, you know, mandatory and and an object of much discussion, I started just finding all these people really complaining about having to take their gas mask somewhere. And, And, you know, we kind of we don't give it that much thought now, I think, because there never was a gas attack. So it turned out to be a precaution that didn't need to happen. But you know, at, at the time, they were absolutely convinced that at any moment, like, you know, these bombs containing gas were going to fall from the sky and kill hundreds of thousands of people all in one go. And, you know, so you have all this kind of these drills and learning to how to put it on, how to take it off and like about as much social pressure and messaging as you can imagine saying, always carry your gas mask. And the number of people who just spend 1939 whining about taking their gas mask places with them is, is so funny. I <laughs> can't know? remember what I was reading or whether it was research for a podcast, but there was a brilliant one about someone found a woman's gas mask uh, that she had left lying around. And in addition to the gas mask in the box was a lipstick, a mirror, some serviette. Like literally by the time she got to the gas mask, she would have been dead because it had become her handbag. Yeah, and I mean, that comes up so often that like, you wouldn't believe. I mean, people just, just, conf- I'm, I'm going to see if I can find my favourite one about masks because it's so, oh, it's this one. Okay, so this this is um, a, the diary of a shop assistant in Great Baddow, Essex, uh, in April 1940. In street, saw a woman trying to get a small parcel into her gas mask case, one of the zip fastener type, which presumably did not contain her mask. It won't go in, she said to her friend. It takes such a lot of things sometimes. <laughs> you just... <laughs> All the people who looked like they were carrying their mask, but were actually just carrying <laughs> Crap. Like a piece of fish or something. Yeah, you know? yeah. outstanding. Uh, so I, this has been brilliant. But what's your, you mentioned a few of the diaries that you kind of fell in love with. What's your favourite mm-hmm. entry in the whole book? Can you single one out? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I can actually. And it's um, the reason that I like this so much is just it really wry humour, but also it does feel like a message for now, which is so this is um, a woman who is works in PR in an aircraft factory in Slough in Buckinghamshire, written on the 11th of October 1944. And she said, I read somewhere the view that the change from war to peace would be so gradual we should hardly notice it. It will not be something definite and spectacular like lights up, bananas for all, unlimited, fully fashioned, real silk stockings at two six a pair and everyone with a job they like and able to afford their own plot and bungalow. (laughs) 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 So like wonderfully realistic and and actually, you know, it's genuine foresight because she's exactly right. You know, so many people were in exactly the same way that we're kind of like, oh, great, a vaccine. We can all go back to normal. They were like, you know, the moment peace comes about I can just go back to the life I had in 1938 and they couldn't and you know and the world changed forever in so many ways that none of them could really predict and you know at that point you're less than a year off the first atom bomb yeah you know it's yeah I I find it just it, it makes me laugh which is why I like it so much but it also it just feels like genuinely good advice yeah, because I nothing's going. I mean, what is normal anymore? I just will people go back out to high street shopping? Or well, he just accelerated the death of the high street by everybody sort of being forced into using online. Uh, the same with being forced away from using cash. Will people go back because people just don't want your cash at the moment? So people no. have adapted. I don't think there is a normal anymore. I think it might be more recognisable, but there are certain mm-hmm. things that aren't going to change back, and the things yeah. as well like the air industry. Air travel industry Mm. i mean are we looking at 
people being priced out of holidays and things for a while because people can't afford because airlines have to up their prices to try and claw money back I don't know yeah and it's so interesting to think about and you know will will people go back to work in offices or will everyone just work from home most of the time who knows it, it will be really interesting to see and, and I think you know people one thing I find quite reassuring about the diaries is that you know World War II was dreadful but it, it invented the NHS you know, it would never have happened. They would have never had the social consensus for an NHS without World War Two, and and that you know that's such a huge thing. Uh, you know, and I, I hope we'll manage something similarly good. Yeah, out of this. Uh, but I think we can all agree that a mask bonfire is happening at some oh, point in I can't our futures. Wait. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Well, maybe we can make bunting out of them. Yeah, be really World War Two. <laughs> yeah and have a street party yeah. without social distance <laughs> becky thank you so much for coming on to share this with us uh, obviously we advocate getting your book from an independent bookstore because if you don't use them you will lose them but tell everybody again what the book is called yes so the book is called blitz spirit 1939 to 1945 and um it is available from all good independent retailers um and actually funnily it's uh it's reprinting at the moment which is wonderful news and you know great a- any author is delighted when their book has to be reprinted but it is out of stock at pretty much every major website now but please go to your local indie and buy it because they will have stock and they deserve our support they do boom mm-hmm. thank you so much <laughs> Join us tomorrow when we will be dispelling the mythology of the Spartans. Apparently everything you think you know is a load of rubbish and we're going to fix that. So don't miss out on that one. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life is going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join us on either of those platforms Uh, Marcus is currently working on some benefits for you so uh, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms we're revamping ourselves on both of them so don't forget to go in you can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.